Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Hale. I am co-founder and head of product at Ladder. And to see you all here, a room full of creators and builders who care about inclusion, it's like Disneyland. So thank you for being here. And uh, I hope to contribute to the conversation about how Ladder is building towards an inclusive financial future. So Ladder is life insurance, not just any life insurance, but life insurance that is designed to be instant, affordable, and flexible. Those three things together are really revolutionary in the life insurance market. And uh, we care deeply about life insurance because we understand fundamentally how much life insurance can change someone's life. This little guy on the right here is Jamie. He's the CEO of Ladder. And our founding story is really rooted in his life story. Um, his father, unfortunately, passed away suddenly in his 40s and had had the foresight to get a life insurance policy in place. And as a result, these three were able to stay in their community and in their home and pursue higher education because of that life insurance policy that he had. So we care deeply about bringing life insurance to more people. Inclusion really, really matters. Um, there is currently a $16 trillion coverage gap in the United States, and uh, we care about closing that. When we started Ladder, inclusion really drove a lot of our design decisions. Um, we were building Ladder, as I said, to serve people who weren't being served by the existing market. And we felt that it would be important to go direct to customers and to really pierce through all the layers of the value chain. Um, so we made some early decisions that um, meant that we wanted to impact the insurance product design. We wanted to impact pricing, of course, the user experience. We wanted to tackle underwriting and also administering policies over the decades. These early choices and doing a lot of that work that is under the waterline um, allowed us to get some really early wins for our customers. So our goal is to democratize life insurance, and because of what we've built, we're really able to um, deliver for users the same exact experience, whether you're applying for a $100,000 policy or an $8 million policy, we want you to be treated well and the same. Um, we wanted to make sure that we underwrite in code. There is a ton of bias that gets introduced when people are being underwritten on the phone, even when folks have the best of intentions, or when they're being underwritten by a human being looking at a piece of paper. We really care about giving the user control and freedom, and so using technology, we're able to provide laddering, which is hence the name ladder, which allows people to change the coverage amount that they have over time at their discretion, and they can cancel any time. Um, and we also really care about earning the user's trust, and our technology focus and our technology stack have allowed us to have a strong API platform, which means we can partner with people who have already built up the trust with their users. So that's a little bit of, a, of background about Ladder, and uh, I want to talk about a framework that we use to think about what's next in our journey toward inclusion. I'm going to walk through seven questions that we ask internally. I hope that they're helpful for you. And I'm going to give you a sneak preview of what the last question is, because I want to come back to it, and I want you to be thinking about it all the way through. And that is really, what is the next right thing? I think it's really important that we all stay action-oriented. That's what we're all trying to do and why we're here. So at the end, I'm going to ask you, what's the next right thing for your product in your industry? The first question I wanted to tackle is, what exactly is inclusion? It's a really great word. It's a really big word. But what are we actually talking about? I find it helpful to think about what it isn't. It does not mean that we are building a product for everyone. That's the fastest route to failure. Um, we are still building a product for our target market, and in Ladder's case, for our early adopters. But we want to make sure that within that small circle, we're pushing constantly towards being more inclusive. This is a little definition that I wrote about inclusion, but really it's about pushing against power dynamics in our culture, and we want to make sure that we stay mindful of that, that it's a very long, relentless journey that we're on, and it's important. It's not only the right thing to do, of course it's the right thing to do, it's also really good for our product, for our team, for our community. 
what's the priority? So I mentioned I'm head of product and everything is about priorities. Um, if, if we are not gonna prioritize inclusion, it's not gonna happen. Um, this, the change only happens at the intersection where we want it and where we're willing to dedicate resources toward it. Um, is anyone out here a fan of The Simpsons, the television show? <laughs> yes, oh yes, okay. So there's this great episode that I think illustrates this perfectly where the town gathers and they're talking about funding for education. And a teacher gets up and says, we have to do this for the children. And the crowd is like, yes, the children. And then the finance guy gets up and says, but in order to do this, we're going to have to raise your taxes. And everyone's like, boo, taxes. And it goes kind of back and forth like the children and taxes. And then at the end, they agree to disagree and nothing happens. And I think if we're not careful, that can be the inclusion story. We have to be willing to dedicate the resources to make change. The third question is where are the power dynamics? There are so many power dynamics throughout all of our financial industries, and these are a few of them. Um, there are many. It's uh, where people are going to start to get uncomfortable when you start to ask questions about how does race intersect with our product and our industry? How does sex intersect with our product and our industry? We have to be willing to ask these questions. So what I want to say here really is that it's okay if there is discomfort. Change only happens when people start to get uncomfortable. There are a lot of people who are quite comfortable in the financial markets right now, and that's great for them, but not for everyone else. So we have to be willing to lean into that. At Ladder, um, when, when we think about um, some things that jump right off the page, it's how women and, in, and life insurance intersect. Let's take a look at the macro data and women by the numbers. So 47% of US workers are women. 40% of households with children under 18 rely on a mother as their primary uh, earner. 70% of mothers with children under 18 work. This doesn't even mention that women who stay home with children contribute over $100,000 a year of economic value to their family. And yet, does anyone have any guesses as to what percentage of individual life insurance covers women? Any guesses? It's high 20s, maybe low 30s, depending on your data source, but like around 28%. That is an inclusion problem. So we have a significant inclusion problem um, with women and life insurance. And it's slightly better at latter, but we haven't fixed it. So the next question is, what is the user problem? Why, in this case, why aren't women getting life insurance? It's unfortunately not as straightforward, as you know, as going up to users and saying, what's your problem? Uh, we have to really be willing to dig through and uncover all the layers of the story. Is it that we have some, some societal bias that women's income is less valuable than men's? Is it that we... Um, the word, like the protective aspect of life insurance is deemed a male trait. Is it something in our product where our messaging is not connecting? Um, there are multiple, multiple ways to understand what's going on and we just have to do the hard work of really figuring out what the problem is so that we can help solve it. And as part of that, we have to keep in mind that the hero of this journey is the user. We are not swooping in to solve things and fix things and make things all better. It's our job to connect with wherever they are in their journeys to solve the problem in a way that works for them in their life. Are we making progress is the next question. So of course, as you all know, if we're not measuring it, we won't know the answer to that. It can be very simple. A key metric for us is just what is the dollars of coverage that's covering women. It can be super straightforward. Um, or it can be, you know, multiple queries and multiple Tableau reports, but it's important to track it so that we know whether we're making progress towards inclusion in a really tangible way. And what's the next right thing? So um, there was actually uh, some interesting research that was done in the early 80s. There were, were a lot of television commercials that were 
about um, starving children around the world, and there was some research that was done on those that found that watchers, people who had watched those commercials, actually felt like they had done something just by watching the commercial, whether they gave to the cause or they didn't. And I think one thing that's important for us to remember as we gather here and we talk about inclusion, that's really great, but we have to hold ourselves accountable to make sure that we're taking the next right steps and we're not just getting excited and passionate about inclusion only to have no action follow that. So my challenge to you is what is your one right next thing? I would love to, um, I'm going to open it up for questions, but I would really love to hear what's your next right thing, what's your product, what's your industry. I think we can learn a lot from each other and, and, and share what we're working on. Thank you. Anyone want to share? One tangible thing. I'll tell you mine. I have, um, I'm going to dig into some really specific product data where I actually have a hypothesis that there may be a difference in um, how women and men are, are reacting in this one particular step in our funnel. So I'm, you can ask me next time you see me if I did it. I'm going to dig into it when I get back. Anyone else have something specific they're willing to share? Okay, that's okay. Write it down. You can tell me about it later. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Laura? Yeah. Um, you, you spoke about how women don't, you know, have a lower basically purchase less insurance than men, essentially, 27%. Do you believe that that is attributed to, I guess, a tradition of historically men being the breadwinner and thinking about planning for the rest of the family as and when they build out an investment insurance plans for the family in case of a catastrophic situation? Mm -hmm. That they themselves think, well, if there's no man in the house, therefore there has to be income to supplement or money to supplement them no longer being around. Do you think that contributes to that lower number with women buying insurance? I do think that, that those kind of um, historical mindsets contribute to it for sure. Um, I also think that it's really, we've done a ton of user interviews around this, and it's really important for men to realize if they're in a, a partnership with a woman and she passes away and if she's taking care of the children, they really need that, that she had had life insurance. Like, it's, it's for them, really. It's for them and for the children. And I think there's a little bit of a um, cultural phenomenon going on there where they're not recognizing that need. Yeah, there's a lot of really, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting things in there, right, to dig into, and there's not going to be one story that resonates for everyone, but I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's something going on at a societal level there that accounts for a big part of the discrepancy. Yes. Is there a cost associated with changing your um, life insurance limits and how does Lada solve that problem? It, it felt like a very unique like product differentiation that, that, that Lada has. Um, and just out of curiosity as well, are you working with a lot of legacy systems in the back end? And is that a hindrance? Is that a, um, a is that something you're, you're facing? Sure, well? yeah, those are two really good questions. So with the laddering feature, um, users can always apply for more, and they're underwritten when they apply for more uh, coverage. If they want to tailor down their coverage over time, which is something that's really good for a lot of users, as children grow up, you need less life insurance to cover them. Um, or as mortgages get paid off, you need less life insurance. And with that, the user can just come in with a couple of clicks and tailor it down whenever they want to, and there's no fee associated with that. 
And not only is there no fee, but it, the, the price decreases proportionally. So if you cut your life insurance coverage by 25%, your price goes down by 25%. And that's because we have no hidden fees built into the insurance product design. Um, on your question with legacy tech stack, one of the best parts about being at a startup is our tech is gorgeous. Uh, we don't actually have to interact with any legacy systems. Um, we do reinsure the risk of, of ladder policies in real time with a reinsurer, um, but our, our technical integration there is really light, so it's nice. Yeah. You don't take any risk. You offload all of your uh, liability to a real insurer or just a percentage of it? We do. Right now, we offload 100% of the risk to a reinsurer. Um, so we're sort of operating on what we think of as a virtual balance sheet. Um, but they take the, the risk of the product. We do the underwriting. They take the risk. So are they a partner? Yes. In, in, in your business? Yes, Financial sure. partner? Not a financial partner, no. Are they, they're a risk partner. Are they disclosed on somewhere in your... Yeah, we, it, the partnership is with Hanover. Yeah. What extent uh, the insurance gap that you mentioned? To what extent is there also um, just speaking of inclusion? It's so primarily socioeconomic, like people who make less money are less likely to have life insurance um, because they can't afford it. Or are the psychological factors that you mentioned? Do you find those to be more important when people are thinking about insurance? Yeah, definitely. So um, a big part of it is financial. Um, there, there are a few things going on here. So number one, uh, there are a lot of people who don't feel um, sort of financially confident to make a decision around life insurance. And their connection to life insurance is with a broker. And there are several people who, um, who have jobs where they can't actually take time out of their day to meet with a broker. And um, so it's important to us at Ladder that people can access us and our website, of course, 24-7 and make decisions when it's right for them. Um, price is a really, really important part of getting life insurance in place. And the traditional industry tends to focus on whole life products that are also sort of in investment blended products. They're way more expensive than just kind of pure term life insurance um, on the order of like 10 plus times as expensive. So that's a big piece of it too. All right, thank you. <laughs>